Hello, I'm Peter Boom. I'm an enrolled member of the Upper Skagit Tribe of Washington State. I live in Tacoma, Washington. I grew up on the Northern Ute Reservation in Utah, but I also spent a number of years on the Quinault Reservation, the Squaxin Island Reservation, and currently in Tacoma, we live near the Puyallup Reservation, which is my wife's tribe. I don't remember a time in my life when I wasn't an artist. I, I as soon as I was able to uh, draw on the wall with crayons or markers, I'm sure I was doing that. I was that kid. I in school I drew on every piece of paper that came my way. I can't imagine life without being creative. I, I just can't imagine it. It's, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I think that it's just who I am. It's part of, part of who I am. As far as growing up on a reservation, it wasn't a big deal to be an artist. Everybody was. Everybody I knew drew. Everybody I knew did stuff. So it wasn't something that separated me when I was young. I didn't think it was a big deal. It wasn't until I was a lot older um, that it became kind of this thing that it's like, oh, wow, you can, you can do something with it. So I don't, I don't remember not being an artist, but I do kind of think about the inspiration that I've had over, over the course of my life, over the course of my career. Life itself is inspiration. Stories are inspiration. When I think about the, the, the artists who inspired me to do the type of work that I do, it would surprise a lot of people that there are only a few Northwest Coast artists who I would call inspirational. Um, Stan Green, Susan Point, Andy Peterson, Marvin Oliver, those, those folks all inspire me. And I've, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to work with almost all of them. And then you have guys like David Boxley and stuff. But I also gather inspiration from artists such as like Rance Hood, um, and he's a Kiowa artist, and Joe Gaishik, he's a, he's, he's since passed away, this amazing artist that, that I grew up and saw their work, Urschel Taylor, number of artists that I saw their work growing up, and I was like, wow, that's really cool stuff. And those ideas kind of still permeate the work that I do today, even though I am a Coast Salish artist uh, almost exclusively, and that my work is very specific, the ideas that I've picked up from around the world and from other artists around the world really permeate the work that I do. And so, and sometimes are the genesis of, of some of the ideas that come around. But mostly it, it comes from storytelling, the, the idea of telling a story visually. As a visual artist, I want to tell a, a story or a multitude of stories in a piece. And, and so trying to figure out how to do that is what steers the artwork. So I am a, I am a Coast Salish artist, and that's a very specific design style within a broader cultural context. Now, Coast Salish, we are the southern tip of Northwest coastal art. So if you look at a map and you see Washington State, Coast Salish folks, we um, it's a language group. And there are about a dozen Salish tribes in Washington State and probably another dozen up in Canada. And we're all throughout the Puget Sound, the interior of Vancouver Island, and, and the Puget Sound area. That's our homeland. And so it's a really distinct design style within the broader context of Northwest coastal art. As you move up the coast from Washington to Alaska, you have different language groups and different cultural groups, and they all have their own distinct art within that broader framework. So the Kwakiwaks have their own distinct art, and uh, the Haidas, the Simpsians, the, uh, the Clinkets. All those groups have their own distinct language, but they also have their distinct art form within the broader context. We're all coastal people. We're all people of the water. We're all, we're all canoe people. Uh, we, we're fishermen. We're carvers um, and, and so forth. So we, we share a lot of the same cultural attributes because our environment is, is very similar. And there's going to be a lot of trade and a lot of overlap, but 
within that broad context, there are distinct forms. And I think that um, a lot of folks, most people probably can't recognize those forms or understand within that broader context. But Coast Salish, we are the southern tip. And we are the most free form of the Northwest Coast Works. And we really only have four design elements that we use. We use circles, crescents, a trigon or V-cut, and an S-shape. And that's about it. And so within those forms, those four forms create everything that we do. And so that's that's kind of what we're restricted to. So my culture is a reflection is reflected in my work, but it is the guiding influence of my work. I couldn't do what I do without that influence and without that framework. At the same time, I think that artists also, we steer culture in a lot of ways. We tell our stories today. We, we're not a stagnant culture. We're not a static um, art form. And so we adapt and change to changing times. We adapt and change to changing materials, to new ideas, to our lives continue to go. So our work is a reflection of what's going on in our lives, which is a reflection of what's going on in the world, but it's still within that framework. So... I think that there's this interplay between art and culture. They, they reflect on each other, but at the same time, art often helps steer culture in a certain direction. And when we look at ancient cultures and historic cultures and maybe even anthropology, we don't look at what they're... Uh, the thing that, that we see and the thing that's left over is the art. And it's from that art that we can understand what their political motivations are, what their societal situations were. And so art is a direct reflection of culture and vice versa. So I, I work at a lot of mediums. I'm um, primarily known as a printmaker, and that comes through a lot. I, I print by hand, so I cut my stencils by hand. I, I pull my screens by hand. I'm a screen printer. I also do embossing, in which I carve a, a master and run it through a an old intaglio press that is about yay big, but weighs about the same as if you did a bus. And um, but the things that I do is is I try to do everything by hand. I like I like to be hands on. I don't digitize my stuff until after it's already finished and done. Then I have somebody else do that for me. Um, I'm really a hands-on artist. I like to just do th do things. I'm a carver, a painter, and it, all of it is the same thing to me. I don't really differentiate between mediums. I just think, well, it's, it's how I can tell a story. It's how I can create this this idea. And, and there are different ideas that require different mediums. I think that uh, for me, it always starts with a sketch. And so I walk around, I I have a sketchbook with me everywhere I go, most of the time. And I'll sketch something out. If I don't have a sketchbook, I have a writing utensil, a pen or a pencil. And napkins are always around and there's always something to write on. So it's one of those ideas of constantly working on putting an idea down. It might now, later on, I might look at that and go, what was I thinking? Or That was a terrible idea. But I, sometimes I'll go through old sketchbooks and go, wow, that was a really good idea. It was poor execution, but it was a great idea. Now I can take that idea and, and with the skills I've, I've, I've acquired since that idea originated, I can uh, do something else with it or I can add to that uh, original idea. And so that happens with, with me a lot where – Things will percolate for years and years, and finally it'll be like, oh, this is how I should should do that. Oh, I should re really revisit something. So um, I'm constantly creating, but it's this kind of circular motion where I'm creating old things that I've been thinking about for a while. Sometimes a new idea will just come and just you can put a new piece out just instantly. It's really, really quick, really effortlessly. Others take take a while. So my creative process might be or is likely different from most. My creative process is one that I am just constantly working on something and thinking about things 
and trying to implement them in, in a different way. And then I have a tendency to work in batches or groups where as a printmaker, I like to print for a number of times. So I'm, I'm currently in the process of printing about four different pieces right now. And I have another dozen lined up that I'm going to try to finish by the end of the year. So, and I hadn't printed until this point in the year. I've been working up to it. So it's almost an assembly line process at a certain point where I get the idea finished. Now it's a, now it's a matter of executing it and turning it into a print form. So I cut out a stencil and there's a stencil for every color and you have to register, get them all lined up and then you have to cut paper. I'm actually waiting on a paper order now. So I, I will be printing some new pieces within the next couple of days. I finished one last night. So I'm, I'm pretty excited right now about the creative journey. Twenty twenty has been a strange year for everybody. I live in the Pacific Northwest, and we were really the epicenter of of COVID nineteen when it first came down. I work uh, for the Tulalip tribes. I'm also an attorney, so I, I work for the Tulalip tribes as a defense attorney in their drug treatment court. And Everett is just south of the Tulalip tribes, and Everett was the first uh, city in the United States with a COVID case. And then there were people within Tulalip who, who contracted COVID right away. And so Washington State, we, we were locked down right away, just one of the very first. And so I know people who contracted COVID. I saw it firsthand, and it's pretty terrible. And it was terrifying to know how easily it was spread and contracted. And so it, Washington, we, we experienced it first, and we, we experienced it hard. And we're still experiencing it. Our numbers are, went down, and they're starting to go back up again. The thing about lockdown was, for me, it actually happened at an interesting time. I, ha I had been working on or working towards a number of, uh, a couple of solo exhibitions. I had been working on a, an exhibition in France that I was going to go to. I'd been working towards a number of shows, but I have been a working artist for a number of years. And I haven't really slowed down enough to like take a look at my studio and see what shape it was in, to look at my inventory and see what shape it was in, and to just reflect on what it was I, I want to do. And the lockdown and the subsequent cancellation of everything that I was doing artistically, I mean, everything was canceled. Uh, it came at a, at a pretty opportune time for me. It was, I was very grateful for it. I know a lot of people were and still are very anxious. Um, artists by definition, we spend a lot of time alone. And so it's, it's not that big a deal for us to be kind of locked up and be alone. It wasn't that big a deal. But for me, it gave me opportunity to go through my studio, to clean it out, to get rid of a bunch of stuff I didn't need, to organize better, to plan better. And I needed that time. I, I really, really appreciated that time. I needed it. The other thing that it allowed me to do was to do work, not for the commercial value of the work, but just because I wanted to do it. And so I ended up doing about a dozen or so paintings that I have no idea what the what the reaction is going to be from people. I don't know. I don't really care. It was something I wanted to do. And so it really allowed me to have this opportunity to try new things and to try new new styles and new painting. And so I knocked out a, a number of pieces. I experimented experimented in in some ways that I probably, I just wanted to try different stuff. I did a, a necklace. Is some, I don't do jewelry generally, but I created a necklace. It's very unique. Um, and so I was pretty pleased with being locked down for a while. I think that financially it's, it's, it's difficult. It's been a, I, everything's been canceled. My sales have probably maybe like two or three percent of what they 
normally were. So it's a 98% loss if you look at it in percentages. Um, so that's been difficult. I try not to react to popular culture. I try not to, to react too much to the political leanings of things. I know that folks get really upset when they learn about uh, mistreatment and disparate treatment of peoples, but that's something that indigenous people have been dealing with 500 years now. So it's not new to us. Uh, unfair situations, it's not something that's new. So I try not to put too much of that into my work. I'm really more interested in telling stories of either my tribe, my family, or what's going on environmentally. Those are the those are things that I, I really try to put into my work. I want my work to be more timeless than timed. It's I I don't like to put dates on things so much. I would rather a piece be you could hang it on a wall for 50 years and still be relevant. Um, I'm not, not really interested in protest art so much. There are other avenues that I can use to address those issues. And, and I don't think that for me personally, it's, it's not something that really drives me creatively and artistically. I'm a lot more interested in, in telling different types of stories. So I get asked a lot whether there are people that are following my footsteps or passing things on. My son is a phenomenal artist. He's 18, and he has more control and more creativity at that age than I did by a long shot. So I'm really excited to see what, what he turn, turns into artistically. He's had the advantage of growing up with me and having all my connections. So he's an amazing artist. I also, I've worked with 50, 60 artists in the area, younger artists. As a printmaker, I help them. They, they come bring their stuff to me and say, hey, will you print this for me? And I'm like, yeah, maybe if I can, if I have the time. But I've printed for probably 50 or 60 other artists and walk them through the design process walk them through and help clean up some of what they're doing. I've done a number of things. I, I did print work for a couple of casinos and hotels. And one of the, and so we created this program as a printer that where we would find artists within the community and print their work. Uh, the, ho the hotel or casino would pay for the printing fee. The artist would get half of the series and then the hotel would get half the series. And so they're getting these signed original pieces that would be um, for for much less price than they would have otherwise if they would have bought them either wholesale or even retail. And the artist gets to sell the remaining half of the series. And so that worked out really, really well from a business perspective for everybody. It was kind of a win-win-win situation. But we, enter, we ended, ended up introducing a, probably about 20, 25 artists in the region to a wider audience. And so that's been way that's been one way that we've worked. And then I've I've done workshops and and then my door is always open for artists who want to come and talk with me and try different stuff. Um, my only rule is I, I work with indigenous artists. And that's that's pretty much it. It's like come on in, we'll do the work, but I'm not gonna do it for you. Uh, and uh, but I'm I'm really proud of of my son. I'm really proud of my kids that who have done amazing work. And then I have other family that comes in and other artists that will pop by and say, "Hey, I want to try something. Let's do something." And so I think that that's just kind of a common practice with indigenous artists everywhere. Is that our doors are open, our studios open. Come on in. Let's try this out. So here is a piece I finished yesterday. It's my newest piece. You are the first people of the world who have seen this piece. This is a an eagle. It's an embossed serigraph. Just finished with the embossing. I I haven't titled it yet. 
got a couple of names I'm choosing, but it's about changing direction, about pivoting and, and changing in life. We have a lot of eagles here, and when you see them fly and they'll chase something, they will change direction really quickly, and they'll flip their wings from horizontal to vertical. So this is that idea. And so I just finished this one last night. I'm pretty excited about it. I just finished embossing the the whole series. So this is a, a piece that's um, going to be available for a little while. I did 65 of them, I believe, in the series. All right. So this is a little bit different for me. It's not something that you would normally see from, from my work. This is acrylic on canvas. Snow geese. So in the Skagit Valley, where uh, my tribe is from, in hmm, a couple months ago, but about this time of year, really, though, we'll have millions of snow geese hit the valley, and they'll they're just all over, and they're just these white. They're not even that really. They're not really that attractive to look at, but as a flock, when they take off and fly, because they, they're migratory, so they fly south, and then they winter. Uh, they winter down south, but this is one of their stopovers, and then their breeding grounds are up in the Arctic. So they will just take off, and as a flock, they're like fascinating because you see just this white bird with these black tip tips on their wings. So I wanted to do a couple of pieces about snow geese, and this is one that I came up with. Um, just different for me, but it's one that I I'm, I'm I'll probably do a print version of this. I'm still kind of working out some of the details, but yeah. So I have. Uh, a handful of smaller paintings that I can do a quick show of. Here's another snow geese piece that I did. I was interested in the form of the geese. We don't actually have a lot of stories about snow geese. It's just one of those animals that is in the area, birds that are in the area that we see, but we just don't really talk about that much. And I haven't seen uh, Sailor Snow Geese image, so I wanted to do one, and this is that. This is a piece that I'm actually really excited about. It's um, the, one of the things about Sailor's art is that we take negative space very seriously, and this one is two salmon. And it's a returning to spawn. Uh, one's upside down, one's on top of the other, and then there's water in between. It's, it's somewhat of a reflection. And it's, I wanted to do it in completely in the negative space. So I'm really excited about this piece. It's acrylic on canvas. I will be printing this in the next week or so. I'm just waiting on paper. And, and it will be available. But I'm really excited about this particular piece. So for the humor, a little bit of humor, this is definitely a 2020 style thing. This is a bear fishing and he missed. Because not every not every attempt to catch fish is going to be successful, so he's uh, head first in the water. The fish is the salmon's gone past him, and this is called head over heels, and this very much is about the idea that you know we got to keep trying. We just you're gonna you're gonna fail frequently, and the more often you fail, it just says that you're you continue to try, and this is one of those ideas that. We just have to keep trying because eventually it only takes the one success to define success. The rest of the time you're going to be trying. I think that um, it's it's a good time to be kind to one another and to really take look at what we're doing in in life and go what's important. I think that it's one of those periods of reevaluation and figuring out what we need to be doing. I, I, I miss traveling. I miss seeing people. Um, and I look forward to seeing them. I hope everybody is safe in the future and it behaves appropriately to keep themselves and their family safe. So I wish everybody all the best.